So my talk today um, is an architectural history of obsolescence, where the idea comes from, where the idea comes from that buildings and cities can rapidly lose their value and utility and so become expendable, and how architects and others responded to the perception that architectural obsolescence characterizes modernity. At the same time, what I'll hope to do in this paper is to address the open question about capitalism posed here by the historian Eric Hobsbawm. How is it then that humans and societies structured to resist dynamic development come to terms with a mode of production whose essence is endless and unpredictable dynamic development? It's the argument of my talk this afternoon that in architecture's confrontation with obsolescence are answers to Hobsbawm's question of how people come to terms with the contradiction between, on the one hand, as he says, capitalism's endless change, and then the other hand, the deep human need for constancy. I'll begin with the invention of the idea of obsolescence. The term was first applied in English to architecture about a century ago to help explain the unsettling phenomenon of American down, down, downtown skyscrapers like this one in the Wall Street area, recently built and still physically sound, but now brought low by a process of what was first called financial decay and then obsolescence. Experts like the New York engineer Reginald Bolton at this time sought causes for obsolescence's sudden loss of value in factors of urban change, changes in technology, or just evolution in fashion and taste. The idea that something new and better would come along to outcompete the old. As you can see in the table on the right, Bolton hypothesized obsolescence by different kinds of buildings. Banks, for example, holding their value longer than hotels due to different rates of change in use. And the shortest lived type of building here, the taxpayer might be an unfamiliar type to you. This uh, small built type of building would be constructed if someone owned a plot of land. They weren't making a lot of money off of the existing building on it. They wanted to lower their tax liability. They would demolish that building and leave it perhaps as a parking lot or just a simple one or two story building that they imagined would be temporary, just enough money to pay the taxes on the land until a developer or they themselves came along and built something more lucrative. If you've ever been to Manhattan and wondered why at the corner of a lot of blocks there are these old one and two story buildings, those were taxpayers built maybe 60, 70 years ago um, that lasted a lot longer than Bolton imagined. So that was an idea that you could build a building that would simply be a placeholder until something more lucrative to make more money off of the land could come along. Further impetus for studying architectural obsolescence was given in the mid-19-teens by the new U.S. federal income tax, which allowed deductions from income for the cost of obsolescence, that is, your building losing value, uh, or potentially because something new and better would come along, but the tax code did not specify exact rates of deduction. The Chicago-based National Association of Building Owners and Managers now set about investigating the matter they wanted to come up with a specific building lifespan number that they could then tell the tax authorities to allow them to write off the building in a certain number of years. This association conducted what they uh, called autopsies, the famous lost of Chicago landmarks, identifying causes of obsolescence, like the Tacoma building on the right's inefficient layout. The idea here was that those thick load-bearing walls you see in the middle of the floor made the building not completely flexible for remodeling for different types of offices with these fixed walls. That meant that you didn't have a maximum capability for rental, so eventually it was felt the building became obsolete. Or in the center, Henry Hobson Richardson's well-known Marshall Field wholesale store that because of its thick granite base was inadaptable to reuse for retail purposes. Statistics assembled from Chicago's Loop District supported the case of, for office buildings 30-year lifespans. You can see here they've averaged the age of certain demolished buildings and then come up with the idea for tax purposes that buildings were only going to last 30 years, so they should get an approximately 3% deduction of its value every year. 
The building owners and managers just about got their wish when federal authorities set office building lifespans at 40 years. The political achievement here had been to turn the extreme cases of Chicago's obsolescence rates, that is, there was hardly any downtown in the 1920s that was being rebuilt so rapidly, but these now became low building lifespan numbers for the benefit of owners nationwide. Everyone could write their building off as if it was going to be gone in 30 years or so. In effect, this was a public subsidy through the tax code for private capitalist reinvestment. It was actually unique to the world's tax codes at this time and characteristic of American political economy that allows business interests more or less to set government policy. In Britain, for example, without tax deductions for building obsolescence, no similar discourse on obsolescence ensued at this time. The cultural achievement of the real estate capitalist discourse on architectural obsolescence as evidenced by numerous newspaper, magazine, and professional journal articles. You can see here in this cartoon from Collier's the idea that, as it says, today's building is tomorrow's junk pile. This helped establish in American public consciousness the myth of shortened building lifespans as an inevitable feature of modern life. This was mythic, of course, because buildings don't magically disappear at 40 years of age. Their fates are contingent, not predetermined or biological based instead on the uncertainties of fashion and feeling, technological innovation, and politics. What the invented paradigm of architectural obsolescence did do was make sense of these unsettlingly changeful times. The idea of obsolescence helped people to come to terms with capitalism's chaotic process of redevelopment, that is, the puzzling site of all these recent still physically sound buildings being demolished but now with this idea of obsolescence it seemed logical beneficent profitable even progressive that new would replace old rapid demolition reinvestment and rebuilding now had a name obsolescence an architectural analog in effect to the economist joseph schumpeter's famous mid-century definition of capitalism as creative destruction new constantly superseding old Subsequently, the paradigm of architectural obsolescence expanded its domain beyond its American business inventors' intentions to the urban and social realms. From the mid-1930s through the 1950s appeared worldwide numerous references to the obsolescence of cities. In Europe, urban lifespans were projected at some 80 years by the Swiss planner Hans Bernoulli and East German tenements were deemed obsolete in a socialist society. In America, urban obsolescence denoted substandard economic and also public health performance. Um, as you can see in the slide here on the upper left, the West End neighborhood of Boston, this dense packed working class tenement district, was in the early 1950s explicitly deemed obsolete that it is, it didn't come up to the standards that people expected uh, how to live um, in the city. And appraisers went around with forms like the one you see in the middle there, marking off, for example, how many broken windows they found, or faulty toilets, um, or how many businesses there might be uh, existing cheek by jowl with residential areas. And they would use these appraisal forms to tabulate penalty points. And if a certain neighborhood overpopulated, poor public health, achieved a certain high number of penalty points, it would be deemed obsolete. And this then triggered the possibility for Boston to receive federal urban renewal dollars. So the more penalty points, in some ways, the quicker the redevelopment. And so it was slated for demolition, as you see happening around 1960 in the slide on the right there, and uh, there would be new reinvestment in the city. So prominent was the idea of traditional urbanism outmoded by modern planning and suburbanization that in 1959, the Ford Foundation could declare, quote, the physical city as it has existed for hundreds of years is becoming obsolescent, unquote. By the 1950s, obsolescence in all its varieties, from America to Europe, office buildings to cities, had become an underlying paradigm worldwide for conceptualizing 
and managing change in the built environment, especially in consumer cultures like America, where everyone was expected to buy the new model car as rapidly as possible, charmed by notions of planned obsolescence and expendable commodities. Shortened building lifespans and obsolescent cities became myths of modernity, infusing everyday experience with the dominant values of capitalism, making its form of change, this rapid creative destruction, seem normal, rational, and logical. And I would argue, obsolescence differed from past paradigms that ways of understanding change. Unlike, for example, the 19th century redevelopment of Paris under the leadership of the governor of Paris, uh, Baron Haussmann, 20th century urban obsolescence appeared technocratic and impersonal wasn't associated with one particular um, uh, figure's name. A matter not of high-handed politics, it seemed, but an inevitable economic law of development. Moreover, obsolescence is very fast, unceasing ruptures, departed from architecture's traditional ideal of a slow, organic development, epitomized by the ruins, right? This is the idea of how people expected buildings to change over centuries, gradually nature would overcome them. Not this idea that within a generation all the buildings you saw around you would be leveled to the ground. Obsolescence was thus a new process of change with which architects still had yet to come to terms. How then did architects respond? At first by denial. Traditionalists like uh, Paul Cray and avant-gardists alike like Walter Gropius actually both held fast to permanence and finish as paramount values, as the quote by Gropius insinuates. And notwithstanding, on the bottom, the 1914 Futurist Manifesto's call in its text for expendability and transience, the buildings that illustrated this article by Antonio Santalia, these huge massive concrete um, uh, structures, were themselves didn't look like they were going to become obsolete and transient. They actually seemed massive and immutable. So architects might say one thing, but they still really held fast to this idea of permanence and durability as architecture's traditional values. It's true at this time that a few outsiders did recognize opportunities. The American Buckminster Fuller's craned components were inspired by automobile annual model changes, right? Your apartment would become outmoded with all its utilities, and you'd call up the company and they'd send over a new unit and the crane would stick it in. In Europe, the Czech shoe manufacturer, Tomas Bacha, explicitly projected 20-year lifespans for the factories and houses of his famed company town of Slim. Mainstream designers only began to deal seriously with obsolescence in the post-war period. Some architects accepted obsolescence as premise, as promise of liberation from the past, and eventually the present too. British critic and historian Rainer Banham began in the 1950s promoting what he called an aesthetics of expendability for the ages, quote, throwaway economy. Countryman Richard Llewellyn Davies organized research at the University of London that analyzed hospital obsolescence, that's the chart in the middle, in which uh, researchers went out to hospitals all over the country to see how quickly different departments within a hospital would have to change. And they also theorized what they thought were obsolescence's trajectory, the idea that over time all buildings, as you see in that chart on the left, would lose value and that they could only uh, regain that value if they were rebuilt, um, demolished, or readapted. This presumption that over time all architecture is devalued. By the 1960s, most everyone actually believed that obsolescence ruled the day in architecture. The quotes you see here were typical comments, none I think especially insightful. It was in design and not words that architects engaged most deeply with obsolescence. The prime design solution to obsolescence was the open plan factory shed. The idea of internal adaptability versus unforeseen change taking place in these fixed structural shells. This model of the factory shed or loft space was adopted for schools and offices. That idea of um, flexibly reconfigured open classrooms or offices where the furniture could be moved around and also adapted for labs and hospitals with the idea of stacked 
vertical interstitial surface levels. So what you see here is the main floors uh, can be all reconfigured infinitely because all the surfaces are up in an inter interstitial <coughs> floor that can be moved around then. So you basically got stacked factory uh, floors. All discussions of flexibility at this time, all discussions of flexibility were in effect just worries about obsolescence. A cultural variant of interstitialism, that is the separation of the service structure from the served, um, appears in Paris's Pompidou Center for Modern Art, which externalizes and verticalizes, that is, lays upward on the outside of the building, its service zone, and all the piping and, and uh, ductwork for obstruction-free exhibition lofts. Berlin's new National Gallery submerges its everyday functions, leaving above ground the apotheosis of the factory shed solution to obsolescence. Here, change is absorbed within a fixed monumental frame. This represents one architectural way to come to terms with ceaseless change <coughs> and obsolescence, to admit its freedoms internally, but contained within a serene, fixed external permanence. Other architects, however, rejected the factory shed solution to obsolescence as too fixed and monumental, and thus unrepresentative of modern dynamism. Instead, they promoted more open form. Thus, the largest British medical complex of its day, Northwood Park Hospital, and you can see that one of its designers is Richard Llewellyn Davies, who had conducted prior to this a lot of obsolescence research. This complex features a loose jointed site plan of demolishable blocks and growing ends. That is, the idea is that if the hospital as an institution changed, you could subtract one of those blocks without disrupting the function of the overall whole, or you could expand one of those blocks by taking away that fire stair and those metal panels and adding onto the building. So what we're looking at here on the lower uh, left is in effect a cutaway section of the building. The idea here was that this complex could both grow and potentially shrink with obsolescence as contingencies. The architects called this indeterminate architecture, forever unfinished. Yet in the midst of all this flux, order is still required. This was provided by Northwood Park Hospital's corridor system that was, as you can see, snaking, pointer won't work, snaking through the building like this. This was the part that allowed it to grow with order and to change with calm. The logic of the factory shed is reversed, where the external was fixed and the inside fluid. Now at Northwood Park Hospital, the overall form morphs, but identity is maintained internally by the corridor system. What you have here is permanence and impermanence trying to be blended and harmonized. And this idea of permanence and impermanence harmonized in an age of obsolescence was the theme, too, of the megastructure which featured long-life frame and short-life capsule constructions, a type associated particularly with Japanese architects. One of the so-called metabolist group of architects, Noriaki Kurokawa, focused particularly upon imaging the megastructure's joints. Its key detail were the two temporalities, fast and slow conjoined. In effect, the spatial transition of obsolescence. So the way that a megastructure could ward off obsolescence is those capsules could be unbolted and new ones could be bolted in. And this idea of the joint as the part of the building, the design part of the building, that makes it adaptable to obsolescence, you can see his interest in that, um, both in the diagram in the center there, as well as the detail from the temporary pavilion where he's really emphasized the joints in that structure. Another architect, Peter Cook, and his plug-in city projects sought to fix in architecture not the spatial but the temporal transition of obsolescence, that moment in time when function falters and value is lost. Cook produced this 16-frame analysis of an imaginary plug-in university's growth and adaptation. But this, this process curiously goes blank in frame 12 at the exact moment of obsolescence when university becomes broadcasting center, that is, it switches functions according to the text. <coughs> 
Here, architectural imaging fails. It's text, as I've said, instead that points to a vaguely defined trend that obsolesces the university. Cook's plug-in university node experiment discovers architecture unable to represent obsolescence, that is to fix its image when it happens. The abstract process of obsolescence comes from elsewhere, outside the frame, remains elusive, and beyond architectural representation, why that frame goes blank. Architecture confronts its limit of engagement with obsolescence. <clears throat> the limit of architecture's engagement with obsolescence was also being sensed in a project by Cedric Price, Another Briton, so enamored of expendability that he was the rare architect who took out a membership in the National Institute of Demolition Contractors. Right? Not a lot of architects embraced the idea that their buildings would be demolished within their lifetimes, but Price really felt that obsolescence was the proper framework for change in the modern world. Here, in these images, Price imagines an academic network, that is, this, this idea for a Potteries think belt. The Potteries was a district in Britain that used to be a center for the production of pottery, but now set amidst the country's post-industrial ruins, envisioned simultaneously under construction and demolition. On the bottom there, you can see what Price has imagined is a university set up that you'll be able to uh, bring in by rail, different pods and capsules for teaching, uh, for living, and then as needed, you could take them out. So it looks like it's constantly being constructed and also demolished at the same time. As Price's assistant explained, to avoid the rapid and inevitable obsolescence of fixed structures, is if the university's educational mission is changing, then you would need to change the buildings around to adapt to that. Otherwise, those buildings would become obsolete. Yet the most substantial objects are not the futuristic capsules or ghostly housing modules, like those in the top that are in that abandoned mining pit uh, producing a parking lot um, and also living in teaching capsules, but rather the most substantial objects are the stubborn remainders of the past, the looming slag heaps, that derelict shed in the foreground. In a world governed by expendability, Price's image images suggest that the undead waste of the past will come to haunt the promise of the future. Others besides Price in the 1960s were starting to question obsolescence's logic. He was embracing expendability, made him realize what happens to the leftovers. Social scientists disclosed people's traumas about urban obsolescence, as in the experience of Boston's West End. The urban writer Jane Jacobs famously argued that, quote, cities need old buildings. Time makes certain structures obsolete for some enterprises, and they become available for others, unquote. Culturally, obsolescence came to stand for inauthenticity and waste. The journalist Vance Packard satirized what he called the cornucopia city of the future, where, quote, all buildings will be made of special paper mache torn down and rebuilt every spring and fall at house cleaning time, satirizing the idea of how rapidly we throw things out. And Volkswagen marketed the Beetle as immune to superficial styling and planned obsolescence, as opposed to the way that Detroit was always introducing new styles every year to induce people to buy uh, new models. In architecture, too, protest arose over obsolescence's depredations. Vernacularism celebrated everyday architecture, which does not go through fashion cycles, to quote from the catalog of this well-known Museum of Modern Art exhibit. Artists revalued obsolete remnants, like the Beckers taking pictures of the leftovers from industrial European civilization. Likewise, historic preservation advanced intensively in the 1960s, revaluing obsolete objects extending preservation's purview to recent environs and enjoying increasingly popular support. In Italy, the Communist Party in Bologna rallied to the slogan, preservation is revolution. How did architects respond to these reversals of obsolescence? First, they sought new images of permanence against obsolescence as transience. Here, inflexible, archaic concrete monoliths 
represent, as one commentator wrote about the architect Paul Rudolph's designs and um, being given an opportunity to lecture in one of Paul Rudolph's best known buildings, of course, helped me to show at least one of his images. This one commentator wrote that Rudolph's designs represent, quote, refutation of the artificial obsolescence theory held by planners of disposable cities. These heavy, massive concrete buildings did certainly not look like they could be thrown away um, within one's lifetime. In another vein, architectural postmodernism revalued the symbols of the past. Italian architect Aldo Rossi sought to recreate what he called the primary elements of history, strong, abstract, iconic symbols, strangely empty like ghostly ruins, indifferent to function, as Rossi wrote, and if indifferent to function, therefore immune to obsolescence. Adaptive reuse also became a dominant strategy to revalue ostensibly obsolete buildings. Stripped volumes housed new fittings. Emblematic brick walls embodied soft change. That is, you can see the slow passage of time in the kind of the shadowy leftovers of the previous use of the building. This soft change versus the hard traumas of obsolescence. At the urban scale, adaptive reuse largely means gentrification, the elevation of an area's social identity, and a variation on urban renewal that preserves rather than demolishes. Gentrification and adaptive reuse reverse obsolescence is architectural logic, that is, the buildings are kept, but not obsolescence is social and political effects. Adaptive reuse is gentrification's kindly face. The buildings intact, but the marginalized and working class still gone from them. And of course, ecological architecture has come to the fore, conserving existing resources instead of expending them, first through salvage, and now with highly sophisticated technology, today's architectural vanguard, like this German demonstration project, built on reclaimed land with renewable materials, featuring a high-tech system of energy efficiency under glass. In the 1960s, the sides with and against obsolescence, I would argue, were more or less in balance. Multiple architectures accepted obsolescence's inevitability and even its gifts. These were ways, pragmatic and lyrical, to manage in design Hobsbawm's contradiction between capitalism and constancy, to find ways to accommodate both ceaseless change and fixed identities, to accept risk and embrace the promise of obsolescence. On the other side, preservationism, vernacularism, adaptive reuse, concrete brutalism, postmodernism, and green design rejected obsolescence as expectations of fast-paced change and refused obsolescence as inevitability. These counter tactics exploited obsolescence as contradictions to engineer that paradigm's reversal. They revalued the past, they accounted for suppressed feeling, and they redeemed waste. Revaluation of the obsolete also exposed a crucial contradiction in the capitalist logic of creative destruction. All that was solid need not melt into air to be profitable. The past can persist under capitalism as unpredictably as the future unfolds. In the 1960s, the contest between the two attitudes towards obsolescence were more or less equal, might have gone either way. Passion and imagination were intense in both camps. But by the mid-1970s, the tide had turned. Obsolescence lost its hold over the cultural imaginary. Top-down technocratic decision-making, like that in Boston's West End, alienated popular feeling. Awareness of the Earth's fragility underscored obsolescence's wastefulness and profligacy. Urban and economic crises produced slow growth and diminished expectations for the future. Preservation claimed important victories, as in 1976, when the U.S. tax code began subsidizing historic rehabilitation over demolition. The UNESCO World Heritage Convention, adopted in 1972, continues its global march up to the present time. Today it would seem then we live in the world the 1970s left us, not exuberant expendability, but careful conservation. In a word, the age of sustainability.
the term we might use to group all the techniques from the 1960s to reverse obsolescence, to conserve rather than expend existing resources, cultural and natural. <coughs> Seeing obsolescence and sustainability in sequence points to obsolescence's part in the genealogy, the prehistory of sustainability. But, but we should not see obsolescence and sustainability as completely separate. The relation between the two as as much filial as antagonistic. Adaptive reuse, for example, is a variation on the megastructure. In both, new components inserted into long life frames accommodate change. Obsolescence and preservation are also mutually intertwined. Both define the past as broken off from the present. And obsolescence and ecological architecture mirror each other too in their dependence upon measurable performance. Today's tables of building energy use echo the data mania of earlier obsolescence studies. In both approaches, architectural value and worth is reduced to experts' numbers. Obsolescence endures, even if not as a dominant worldview. In America's older inner suburban towns, Main Street preservation cohabits with ruthless domestic teardowns illustrated here. That is, destroying old post-war capes for the mansionization of uh, what were called McMansions, the selective obsolescence of post-war suburbia. In China, capitalist modernization today sweeps away the past, echoing the American trajectory a century ago. And yet there are differences between 20, early 20th century New York and modern China. Unlike in the mid 20th century, when the centralized city form itself seemed obsolete, Chinese cities today are as dense as ever and exhibit two survivals from the past. That is, no, in China, they don't imagine, as the Ford Foundation did in 1959, that the dense centralized city form itself would be obsolete. And these Chinese cities, as I said, exhibit survivals from the past, as this Shanghai image illustrates. Taken from the roof of a rehabbed 1930s slaughterhouse, looking over other adaptive reuses to the left, surviving tenements in the center, postmodern additions to the city on the right, as well as those modern towers replacing some obsolete buildings. In other words, our time remains, as lived experience always is, polytemporal, the sociologist Bruno Latour's phrase, and in this view of Shanghai. Polytemporal, by that we mean always new and old together, coexisting side by side, obsolescence and sustainability. If, however, obsolescence was the dominant ideology of change for mid-20th century capitalism, rationalizing and giving a name to its processes of wholesale expendability, then arguably sustainability performs the same function for current day capitalism. It may be going too far to declare, as does philosopher Adrian Parr, that, quote, sustainability culture is inherent to the logic of late capitalism, unquote. But the symbiosis is evident. Capitalism, which sired obsolescence a century ago, generates profits today from sustainability's technophilia, that is, making money off of all the technology that can be sold to promote sustainability. And many politicians pin national prosperity to green innovations. Eco-branding, is very effective marketing, as any Whole Foods store aisle attests. And as much as sustainability promises a new, brighter future, can it ever break the current order when its abiding ethic is continuity and conservation, not radical change? As architect Ellen Grimes has asserted, sustainability is, quote, an inherently conservative term, unquote. Sustainability may perhaps be merely an ideology of conservation. It's practice in architecture potentially as profligate as obsolescences. Witness the envisioning of super tall skyscrapers that would trumpet their LEED certifications projected for Jakarta, Mumbai, and Shanghai. 
it's hard to see how these are conservate and promote conservation. Might, in fact, sustainability be nothing more than neoliberal capitalism's updated opiate of the masses, a diverting faith? Ecological crisis arguably distracts our attention from equally, if not more pressing, social troubles and inequalities. In other words, sustainability no less than obsolescence is ideological. Productive for design to be sure, firing architects' imaginations as obsolescence once did, but nevertheless rife with illusion and contradiction. What then, in conclusion, are some lessons from this architectural history of obsolescence? First, it demonstrates the value in a vibrant architectural culture of the impulses both for extreme transformation and the resistance to this transformation. This was the characteristic struggle of the 1960s. Today, the impulses stand imbalanced. Sustainability in the ascendant, obsolescence eclipsed. In Hong Kong, at the recent Asia Society Center building, a new steel-columned walkway runs at a respectful distance from the restored massive masonry wall of an old explosives magazine. The past is a precious jewel here, set off from the present and the future. Less refined but more instructive is the temporality of a renovated factory building in Selene in the Czech Republic. Here a century ago, you'll remember, the shoe manufacturer Tomas Batya imagined 20-year building lifespans. In 2006, the frame of building number 23 was refurbished as a business innovation center. The building has also been augmented, added to, with projecting bronze bays, as at the right. But more significant, something has been subtracted from the architecture at the top. To lighten the structure, broad voids appear in the upper floors, thus shrinking the historical frame. Bacha's intention, the limited life architecture, is honored unconsciously. Building number 23 treats history flexibly, not reverentially. The past is visibly released. The present is open as implicitly as the future, too. Here, then, are lessons from the age of obsolescence for today, showing how to preserve memory and facilitate growth at the same time, to accommodate fast and slow change simultaneously. In a world, as Hobsbawm notes, that requires both these seemingly contradictory temporalities to help us come to terms with capitalism, these different speeds, obsolescence and constancy together. The architectural history of obsolescence and then sustainability also illustrates the flexibility of capitalism its capacity to absorb critique and evolve from its own tensions, to manage the contradictions of its own development, to take what capitalism itself had made obsolete, the industrial age built environment, and exploit its leftovers, and exploit this leftovers through revaluation, through processes of adaptive reuse, gentrification, and historic preservation. Rather than discarding expensive investments, capitalism rediscovered value is supporting new meanings to re-commoditize them, exploiting the built environment one way and then the other, obsolescence and sustainability. In the built environment, then, Hobsbawm's question is answered in concrete form, literally. The built environment was site both of depredation and mediation, the place both to suffer from and come to terms with new modes of change. Lastly, the most general lesson of the architectural history of obsolescence is that narratives of change are themselves changeable creations. Obsolescence, then sustainability. Both were historically invented, possess exploitable contradictions, and can be historically reversed. Obsolescence preceded sustainability, and something else may come after sustainability. And as yet unformed, unnamed worldview for comprehending and managing change in the built environment, and embracing the essential unmanageability of change, the futility of so many efforts to ward off obsolescence in design, may paradoxically be the best guide for moving forward. 
Our futures ought not to be considered ironclad, but rather malleable and contingent. That is the best lesson of this and any history, that like the past and present, the future is as unpredictable and potentially liberating as obsolescence itself. There is still much to learn from obsolescence in architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy, for this uh, great presentation. We are taking some questions from the audience. unexpectedly from outside to make a particular building um, or building type seem obsolete. So, you know, one of the key building types that would seem to be obsolesced in that age is a library, um, right, because people, books are mainly digitized. And so, um, there, you know, at one point, the impulse would have been, well, you know, you need to demolish the old libraries and you can't imagine um, because they've become obsolete. Uh, now. Um, perhaps that's an option, but now we think about other, we think about adaptive reuse. Um, we think about the fact that a particular function is not in a one-to-one -one relationship with the building. That had been always kind of the explicit uh, idea of form follows function, right? If you believe that, then if function changed, then implicitly form would have to change, that one-to-one -one relationship. But it turns out that form uh, may be more adaptable, certain types of form. Um, but as you're saying too, it's not just a matter of function that makes us value a building. The Stark Preservation Movement was really built on emotional feeling towards a building. That was all those quantifications of building worth and value could never take into account how people felt about a building. So if you love your library building, then you'll keep it no matter how obsolete it becomes. Um, and so all those options I think are available to us, but I think it's important not simply to fun focus on buildings' functional use or value, but they've always had an emotional affect. Um, and that in many ways that's what keeps buildings around, is how people feel about them, as much as how well they work, because most buildings can be made to work um, for a new purpose without too much trouble. Does that answer some of what you're asking? But there's a really interesting um, ideological trajectory here, which goes back and forth. You start with Hobsbawm and his critique of capitalism, and then we come to the 60s with Jane Jacobs and others who are attempting to reinvest the urban with more or less a socialist idea. And then at the end, you talk about uh, sustainability as in a sense, having been co-opted once again by late capitalism. Mm -hmm. 
in the end, all of this is about profit. Is that true? And can you talk about that? This shift back and forth uh, between capitalism. Yes. The question is really, are we doomed to a late capitalist society? Um, I think that's a question for a political scientist, not an architectural historian. Um, I mean, for me, what it showed was the extraordinarily, extraordinary adaptability of capitalists, people who see that what their job is is to take money and to turn it into more money through uh, buildings as a commodity. Um, and then what happens when that commodity gets outmoded and reused, you know, buildings hard to discard. Um, and the ways in which they came up with the logic for that, the idea of obsolescence, and they got the government to subsidize it for them with the deduction. And then once, and, but then when there was pushback against that by people like Jane Jacobs, the flexibility to then say, great, we, adaptive reuse can be just as profitable to us as tearing things down. So um, the question of whether this impulse for constant growth and profit and that ceaseless striving after that will ever change. I think we, part of what I was trying to get at is the idea that what we think of as natural around us and as inevitable, like sustainability, actually was created. And, and there was a moment where things could have gone either way. And I guess what I'm implying is that if you think that the way that capitalism is totally natural and that there's no alternative to it, would be to look back and to realize that it's historically created and therefore uh, can be historically reversed. So I don't have any prescription for what might come next, except that the value of history is to realize that the way we live was invented. It's not part of nature. And that goes for paradigms of how we think about change, like obsolescence and sustainability. And the same thing goes about our um, economic and social systems. They were invented. They're not eternal. They're not natural. Um, and that they can be changed, but they're not necessarily going to be changed. It's unpredictable. Anyone else have questions? So thanks uh, so much for the great talk. Um, I love this schema you built between obsolescence and sustainability and the way that you wove it into that historical trajectory at the beginning um, where obsolescence under a modernist era ends in the destruction of a building under postmodernism as we shift toward a more kind of emphasis on sustainability. There are structures that themselves become malleable in response to, and I think that's such a coherent, logical way of thinking about that, that transition. I wonder though, and this is gonna sound very vulgar Marxist, but is the mode of production really what's driving this? Because I look at those factories and I think, well, we've moved from a Fordist mode of production, from ergonomics, repetition of the same, uh, whittling down actions to their most common denominator. All of this relies upon kind of static space the whole idea of repetition and so on, moving toward an on-demand modality of production uh, built on you know, a totally different temporality, contingent workforce, I mean, all of these things of, of, of like capitalism. Is architecture then in this you know, fairly simplistic relationship with, with capitalism where it really is just reflecting and revolving around this huge moment of rupture that's, I think, animating and structuring your, your talk? Um. I hope not. I try not to see things as mechanically as that. It's why I try to um, give some agency to individuals. You know, so I think that if the National Association of Building and Owners Managers hadn't kind of pushed at this idea of obsolescence, it might not necessarily have come to the fore. Or if people like Jane Jacobs hadn't pushed at it. I, so I, I think that there, you know, if you're thinking about what causes, what brings about change. I wouldn't want to say that it's all structural, right? That it's all based on how the economy is working. That there is room for human agency within it. I try to, maybe not as much in this talk as it is in the book, try to account for that. Um, I don't have a work, fully worked out theory of history that is how change happens, but I'm not comfortable, and that's what I was getting at with the final conclusion, is the future is not ironclad. I really do think, and otherwise, what's the point waking up in the morning and doing anything if you're kind of locked in to the future? I think that there are possibilities. And in design, you can see architects trying to work out 
how they're going to join those different temporalities to it. Um, I'm not saying that in design you could, uh, you're going to change the world, that's not what it's about, but you can sort of think through and model different ways to live um, aesthetically, and those might have an impact. So no, I don't, um, I don't take a strictly Marxist point of view that everything is kind of from the superstructure. Uh, that's a pretty grim way, I think, to live your life. I was wondering what is your opinion on the future of the city of Detroit, <laughs> um, which is very interesting to me because of the you know it's all about the automobile and then the, or the train station is still standing and yeah. it's become just a ruin porn because of the automobile and then you know capitalism and moving all the industry out of the country so on and so forth. But there is a, an attraction, a sort of a new tourist thing of ruin poor people that in fact bring more business back into that city and you know artists and whatnot moving or starting new lives for those buildings but what do you think is going to happen to all those beautiful beautiful buildings that nobody wants right well um like i said you never know what's going to come out of nowhere to make something better or worse it would seem to be you know from all the economic logic that once a city like Detroit got so cheap and so devalued that it would be cleared and ready for new reinvestment. I and mean, that's typically how things work. And so perhaps it'll become profitable to move, for businesses to move back in there. But the role of historic preservationists and even people who promote ruin, porn, or tourists, they play a role in this too because they're finding ways to revalue what had been considered obsolete. So, um, you know, Boston, you know, 70 years ago, 60 years ago, was kind of the Detroit of the United States. It was a city that seemed like it was some kind of terminal condition. And so was New York in the 70s. In New York. Yeah. You know, but things come along and change that. You know, Boston was the beneficiary of a tremendous amount of federal government funding for the defense industry in the Cold War period that really, I think, more than anything that any particular politician did here drove things. So for a city like Detroit, the investment is going to have to come from somewhere. Um, and so often, the investment is through the public sector, um, and uh, private business can only do so much. So I guess if I had to say about Detroit, that Detroit would do well to turn itself into the center of hub for wherever the government is next going to invest, um, and the same way that the computer industry in the Boston area um, developed out of um, Defense Department spending. So um, hopefully Detroit uh, it seems to be finding its way forward a little more, um, but like I said, you never know what's going to happen. There may be some intrinsic disadvantages the city has that will make it very difficult for it to become kind of a Boston in the 21st century. Okay, so let's talk about the static. Let's talk about Rudolph here at UMass Dartmouth. Yeah. <laughs> and you probably have walked around and you can see that we have some trailers. Yeah. Which are capsules. Yeah. Sort of, right. And we have a new library. Yeah. And so forth. So, um, talk about Rudolph here, maybe the renovations of the School of Art and Architecture yeah. at Yale. Yeah. Yeah. So, Rudolph's an interesting case. I think this building as well, the Art and Architecture building, there's an interesting tension in these buildings. Um, on the one hand, uh, they're of this concrete material and they really emphasize that kind of permanence and durability, especially in kind of vertical piers and elements of it. On the other hand, the Art and Architecture Building was designed by Rudolph anticipating extension of the building, um, as well as what's contained within those large fixed concrete elements are kind of these open, flexible loft floors. And I think this building has some of that quality too, I don't know it as well, but it seems to have adapted well to kind of being infilled. Um, and so uh, that's what I mean by trying to harmonize different paces of change. Some parts of this building, its infrastructure may remain fixed, but it doesn't mean that the whole thing is kind of um, preserved in amber. Uh, so I actually think that what's been done with this building is really a lovely example, and is similar to that check example that I showed before. And I don't, I know the rest of the campus slightly here, but not well, but perhaps it too has that same capacity to kind of maintain something of its identity and constancy, but also adaptable and to grow as well. 
fact that it's asymmetrical and you know not in this fixed monumental form means that uh, aesthetically uh, you're not going to destroy that image of it by kind of adding bits and pieces or subtracting. Like Northwood Park Hospital was supposed to, you're supposed to be able to take parts away from it. Um, I don't know how flexible this space is, but I think that Rudolph was accounting both for durability and flexibility, though some of his buildings look more um, uh, permanent than perhaps they are. Right, so some things stay the same and, and other bits look like they're infill in them. So I um, actually think there's a lot of opportunity and promise here, and the, the school's been treating that sort of buildings, I think, very well so far. Danny, I know that you uh, uh, talked about this and alluded to this point at the end of your talk, but um, I want to ask you to reiterate uh, those points for uh, for the majority of um, our audience today are young students, many of them young artists and young designers, some of them young engineers. What is your advice for this generation of designers and engineers? Because I know that there are many of them are genuinely interested in sustainable design yes. and ethical approaches. Yes. Uh, so what do you think is the best way for them to move forward with their careers? Um, I think one way is to maybe all young people, and hopefully you do this up to middle age, just to kind of question the what seem to be the truisms that you're taught. I mean, learn them and take them on board. But it, and history then is a way uh, to try to learn more about that. I don't mean that you need to discard what your beliefs are, but part of what this project for me became was, as I said, kind of a prehistory of sustainability. Where did it come from? So, um, to also realize that uh, the things you believe and things that are held now are changeable, right? The way they are now is not always to be the case. Um, but I think, uh, you know, to follow your heart, you know, to figure out what you like to do and what you do well, um, to devote yourself to that career, I think to, uh, you know, oftentimes in the humanities, we, and maybe in the sciences and technology, we kind of inject politics into it. Um, I'm someone who thinks, that even though you can see from my talk, that a political framework for um, my understanding of history is significant. I think that not to confuse kind of politics and you know scholarship or humanities too much. If you really care about making political change, I think the way to do that is directly in the political arena. I don't know if it should ought to be channeled through other modes of our life directly, like how you consume, you know, you buy one good or another and you think you're changing things. I think that if you really are caring about sustainability, um, you should certainly pursue that in part of your career, but also to realize that oftentimes the things we care about are political questions, and that the way to maybe have the most impact is to engage directly politically and still inform your work. But um, those are some very general comments, but I think, um, you know, stay open to the future, always listen to what other people have to say, the things to be learned from that. I think part of what I tried to get at in this talk is not to overly judge one paradigm or another, like obsolescence bad, sustainability good. You know, tearing down the West End was bad, it certainly was in some ways, but I wanted to see things that both good and bad at the same time, and to have a very nuanced view of them, and to realize that they're related. I think that allows you to see things more creatively and to push things forward more. Um, if you think some concept is monolithic and can't be judged or taken apart, then it's hard to see how you can innovate on it. But if you start to see what some of the tensions are within it, it's good and bad, then maybe that gives you some room to operate and to move and to push things forward. Wow, I don't know your bias, but I'm sure you just talking about all that sort of tension. Have you practiced as a practicing designer in some way? No, I went to college thinking I was going to be a pediatrician. Um, and then I was an English major, uh, and I took an architectural history class, and I really liked it. Um, and I realized I didn't want school to be over, so I went to graduate school to be an architectural historian. So I've come at this from the perspective of 
kind of an English major, kind of to look at things carefully and try to analyze them, an interest in history as well. Um, and I teach in an art history department. So I don't, I feel like what I have to say is, made, is not so directed towards practitioners, though it certainly can be useful to them, but towards historians. That's why I opened the talk with an open question of a historian. I think that what architectural history should do as a humanities discipline to be truly interdisciplinary is not just draw from other disciplines, which is one way interdisciplinarity, but to use the techniques of architectural history to answer other disciplines' questions. That would be reciprocal interdisciplinarity. So I'm interested in that type of interdisciplinarity that doesn't just take, take, take from other disciplines, but tries to see what are those other disciplines working on and maybe try to give them some answers to questions they're still working on. Does your, your last set of advice sound very much like a practice or designer's oh. way of looking at the world. That it isn't black and white, that it's subtle, that there isn't just a good and an evil, and that there's very complex problems that we have to solve and to question paradigms. I so thought I, I you were practicing. No, design. and I <laughs> thought that was like a humanist liberal arts perspective on the world, not a professional. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, you know, to question, to question things. So that's my background. Um, uh, and I think that's why it answers your question, Pamela. I think it's so important to remain open. I think college is the time to figure out what you, not what you thought you were good at and what you liked when you were 16 and 17 years old, but to figure out now what you really like, what are your best days, and to try to pursue that. Um, so nowadays, um, I feel like when new buildings um, are made, a lot of a lot of organizations and institutions, they have a strict budget and they don't really pay for the artistic eye or the, um, really for the ornate. They, they build for functionality. How do you think art um, in architecture will continue to mold itself to keep that whole, the idea of art within architecture alive, even though the, the budgeting for it in regards to the people hiring these people? You know, understandably, there are limited resources to provide shelter or the things that we want to function. So um, uh, I think probably the best way is those of you here, even if you're not going to become architects or artists, when you're the person in charge of the budget, realize that how things look and the art and the artistry of them are really important and it actually adds value to a building. Um, the way people feel about it as well. So I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for that uh, to continue. So I think it's, um, I know it's, it's probably frustrating some of the time, um, but uh, hopefully when you all become clients of architecture, uh, that you will not just think of a building as a machine for producing a certain product, but to look back at your own experience of buildings and sometimes one has some kind of visceral, um, ineffable reaction that you can't explain, and not every building can have that, but a good architect can probably provide a little of that in any building, so hopefully you'll have clients someday who understand that. 